2 Corinthians tonight. We, we've, been going through, <laughs> we've been going through the minor prophets, and uh, I was going to start Zechariah, but Zechariah is going to be more than one night, so I figured instead of starting it now and picking it up three weeks from now, uh, we would go ahead and uh, do something, say, share something a little different. We'll pick up on that when we get back. You know, uh, Sunday morning and Sunday evening, uh, I was sharing, and, and Todd was sharing Sunday evening about having the right Jesus, knowing, knowing who Jesus is. You know, everybody, everybody has some kind of Jesus. I was thinking when, when Ralph was here, when he first came here, our friend from Germany, the person we're going to visit, when he first came here, and he, he started coming to this church, probably came, was coming for about a, a month, and he told me, he said, he says, over in America, he says, Jesus is everywhere, he says. When I was driving from the airport, I saw a big sign, Jesus, you know. And he, uh, he was just amazed. He says, it's not like that in Germany. He says, you know, church is church, and it's not like that. And I told him, yeah, well, the name of Jesus is everywhere, but I think our perception of Jesus is, is kind of slanted a little bit in a lot of cases. And um, I'd like you to turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. <clears throat> I heard somebody refer to this scripture. I don't know if, if Todd had mentioned it in his message or if somewhere uh, in the last couple weeks I, somebody was, had just mentioned. And uh, I thought we would read this tonight a little bit and kind of equip ourselves. There's so much stuff out there in the name of Jesus. And some of it's pretty easy to discern. Some of it you don't have to have a theological degree to really understand. But some of it is so close to the truth. It's so close to the truth that if you're not, well, the Bible says, if possible, even the very elect would be deceived. Now, I believe that the Holy Spirit in us, if we're sensitive to the leading of the Spirit, he will teach us, he will lead us in all truth. That's what Jesus said. So we have a truth detector inside of us, not to coin a phrase. We have a truth detector inside of us. And it's important that we learn how to use that. And John, uh, for 2 Corinthians chapter 11. The Apostle Paul, in his writing to the church at Corinth, especially in his second letter, he spent a lot of time defending his ministry. Because his ministry was under attack. Paul was being slandered by false apostles and false teachers that would follow him Wherever he would go, he would go and he would plant a church and preach the gospel and people would get saved and he would leave. And there would be others who would come and try to undermine his ministry and undermine his influence. And they would claim to be apostles and they would claim to be teachers and they would claim to, you know, know Christ. And I'm sure they used a lot of the right words and said a lot of the right things, but it's just a little bit of error, just a little as I said the other night, just a little drop of sewage in a bottle of water pollutes the whole thing. In chapter 11, Paul says this, starting in verse uh, 1. He says, Would to God you could bear with me a little in my folly, and indeed bear with me. Paul was being a little facetious here. He was being called a liar, a false teacher, they were saying he was puffed up and he was proud and all these other things. And he says in verse 2, well, I'll back up just a few verses. Let's go back to verse 17 of chapter 10 just to read into this. Paul says, but he that glories, let him glory in the Lord. He that glories, it doesn't say glory in your speaking ability. It doesn't say glory in what your tally was last month of people you got saved. Or how much money you raised. But he that glories, let him glory in the Lord. For not he that commends himself is approved, but whom the Lord commends. My goodness, we... Folks can stand up and give you a list of accomplishments. 
And that's what these ones who would do, who would follow Paul, they would follow him around and they would stand up and they would boast about all their accomplishments. And you know, Paul, he could have boasted about his accomplishments. He did a lot of stuff. But he goes on and he says, listen, just bear with me a little bit of my folly. He says in verse 2, for I am jealous over you with a godly jealousy. For I have espoused you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Paul said, listen, I'm, I'm concerned about you, Corinthians. I'm concerned about you. In his first letter to the church of Corinth, he answered a lot of questions. He did a lot of teaching about protocol and how things should be done in the body. How Things should be about marriage and how we should behave ourselves and so forth. He, he dealt with a lot of issues. He taught about the resurrection. He gave good teaching to the church there at Corinth so they would have a good solid foundation. But his second letter, after they received his first letter and seemingly they, they did the things he said to do and they straightened some things out, there were still some problems because they were listening and they were hearing and they were allowing people to come in saying things that weren't from God. And Paul said, I'm jealous for you. I want to tell you something. People in ministry, really good, God-fearing men and women in ministry, care about the people they preach to. I'm concerned when somebody comes and tells me that they've been listening to this one or that one, that I know isn't right, you know what I'm talking about. You know, they come to church and they come to Sunday school and they hear preaching and teaching and from God's Word, and then they go out and they start listening to one of these ones on TV. And they come back and they say, oh, I just found this, this guy on TV. He's really good. And you want to say, no, he's not. He's not good. He's bad. He's a good speaker, has a big following, but he's not good. And there's a concern for anybody that ministers God's Word. And I'm sure some of you who have ministered to your loved ones and people that you love dearly, and they come back and they say, well, you know, I've been listening to watching so-and-so. And if you really have the love of Christ in your heart, you've got to be a little jealous for him. Now, just think about Paul. He had these churches that he planted all over the place. He was an apostle. You want to be an apostle? The more authority you have, the bigger concern you have. He wasn't concerned with a church of 10 or 20 or 50 people. But he had churches everywhere in the midst of of a wicked and perverse generation just like this one. In, in the midst of the Grecian world and the Roman world that was fraught with philosophy and, and vain religion. He said, I'm jealous for you. I've, 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 I want to present you as a chaste version to Christ, he says in verse 3. But I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. The further I go, the more I realize how simple salvation really is. Just as simple is a relation as a child to a parent, it's a simple relationship, mom and dad and kids. We try to make our relationship with God so complex and we turn it into a religion. You know, we have this, we have all these when it's really a love relationship. It's a father adoption. We're adopted. We have the spirit of adoption. We, we, we can cry, Abba, Father. Paul says, listen, I'm concerned that your mind should be corrupted because just like Satan in the garden, and we all know that story, he's more subtle than any beast of the field. Just like Satan in the garden was able to go and, and deceive Eve, He's, he's about the same thing. His, his job is still the same. Paul was concerned for the church at Corinth that they might be deceived. For if he that comes, in verse 4, preaches another Jesus, whom you, we have not preached, 
Or if you receive another spirit which you have not received, or another gospel which you have not accepted, you might well bear with him. What Paul is saying here is, you know, if you listen to these guys long enough, you might start believing what they say. Telling the church in Corinth, man, you, you'll listen to anything. And I, I, I have to say, folks, Christians in the United States, we'll listen to, we'll listen to anything. We'll buy anything. <laughs> Dress it up right. Have the right kind of music. Have the right atmosphere. And we'll eat it up. We like it our way. Big Mac with fries, you know. Just like we like it. It's no different back then. They didn't have Big Macs back then. It was the same thing. There were people coming along after Paul, which realized Paul laid the foundation of salvation by faith in Christ, and they, and they saw it as a, as a fertile field for planning deception. Launching what they would say off of the teachings of the truth with just a little bit of error and just a little bit of pride and just a little bit of self. Paul says, I'm, I'm concerned about you. I wonder what he would say about Christians in America. I wonder if Paul had been to this continent and had planted churches. I wonder what he would say today about Christians in America. I'll take it a step further. I wonder, since tomorrow is a National Day of Prayer, I wonder what our founding fathers would say about the United States right now. I don't think this is what they had intended. I really don't. I don't know. That's another talk. Okay. He says, in verse 4, he says, you know, if you listen to them long enough, you're going to believe what they're, what they're saying. But then he says this. He says, for I suppose I was not a whit behind the very chiefest apostles. But though I be rude in speech, they claimed that he was just rude in speech, yet not in knowledge, but we have been thoroughly made manifest, you among, uh, manifest among you in all things. Have I committed an offense in abasing myself that you might be exalted because I have preached to you the gospel of God freely? What Paul was doing was he was appealing to his reputation and his character and his, his style of ministry. He says, I robbed other churches taking wages of them to do you service. And when I was present with you and wanted, I was chargeable to no man. For that, was, that what was lacking to me, the brethren which came from Macedonia supplied. And in all things I have kept myself from being burdensome unto you, and so will I keep myself. He's saying, listen, I didn't do this to earn a living. I didn't work among you to get your money. I wasn't trying to get stuff off of you. I didn't ask you to support me. I did it all for nothing. I depended on the offerings from churches up here in Macedonia, from uh, Philippi and uh, Thessalonica. They, they sent an offering to me. Am I guilty for doing that? Have I offended you by doing that? Have I, is, is there some reason why you would believe these people who would come along after me and slander me because I loved you and told you the truth? You know, something that I've, I've come to the conclusion, and, and I've learned this, and anybody that does ministry, and Todd has learned this, will learn this, and anybody that will do pastoral ministry will learn this. And you can learn this too as individuals in, in, in Christ. You never have to defend yourself against slander. You know that? If you live the way the, the Word tells you to live, and if you conduct yourself the way God tells you to conduct yourself, He'll vindicate you. He'll, he'll stand for you. Now, if I veer off the course and I go do something stupid, that's on me. But the Apostle Paul, he said, listen, you knew how I lived amongst you. You know how I ministered amongst you. And he says in verse 10, As the truth of Christ is in me, no man shall stop me of this boasting in the regions of Achaia. Wherefore, because I love you not, God knows. 
But what I do in verse 12, he says, that I will do, that I may cut off occasion from them which desire occasion, that wherein they glory, they may be found even as we. He's saying, listen, my purpose in writing this letter is to warn you of the evil that comes when false teachers, when false apostles, when people that claim to be teachers of the word, when people that claim to be called to be leaders in the church, come and they preach another gospel. And there's been so much of it. There's been so much of it. I thank God for the the, the folks in this church who are committed to God's word. See, I'm, I'm, we're going to wait for a couple of weeks. I'm not afraid to have Pastor Todd preach because I know he's going to preach out of God's Word. Other people I have come in here that I know, I know, I know they're going to preach out of God's Word. You can't go wrong with that. That's what the Apostle Paul was saying. He said, listen, I'm jealous. I'm concerned for you. I'm, I'm worried about you. Because these people come along, and he dealt with this problem everywhere he went. The church, when he wrote the, the, uh, the letter to the churches in Galatia, Galatians, he was dealing with the Judaizers, who they would call the Judaizers, who would come along. And they would, they would teach that, well, okay, yeah, Paul preached, you're born again, and all that, but now you have to be circumcised. Now you have to go through, the, now you have to become Jews. And they were so good at it that the Galatians were starting to believe what they were saying. Paul said, who has bewitched you, O foolish Galatians? Who has what? Were you saved through works? Were you saved by being baptized? Were you saved by doing something? You were saved by faith. Now you think you have to be baptized or you have to be circumcised to complete your salvation? Isn't the Spirit enough? Every place he went, there would be somebody to come along after him, some imp. Too bad my wife isn't here. There's a big fly right on my Bible. <laughs> okay, no. Lord of the flies, get out of here. Okay. I don't have a fly swap. Somebody would come along and say, well, just like the serpent said. Now, listen to what he said. Verse 13. And this is, I wanted to get to this place. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. Do you know, it seems today everybody claims to be an apostle. You know what an apostle is? Now, the original apostles... The early apostles, they were men who saw Christ, who experienced his presence. They were inspired by the Holy Spirit to write scriptures. That kind of apostleship isn't here anymore. We've talked about this before when we talk about apostles and preachers and evangelists and prophets and so forth. The first century apostles, they, they had a calling and, a, and an anointing that, that nobody else has ever had since and ever will have. The Bi- There's no more Bible to be written. The New Testament was written by the apostles. It's the teaching of the apostles. So some people say, well, there's no apostles today. Yeah, there's apostles today. Leadership in the church. And a greater accountability, a greater responsibility, because as I've said before, the higher you go in the church, the greater the burden. When the Apostle Paul was writing earlier in this letter about being an apostle, he said the apostles were at the end of the parade. Everybody today wants to be an apostle. There's women apostles. I never saw one woman apostle in this Bible. There were women prophets. There were women teachers. There were that. There were women deacons in the Bible. Yes, there were. No women apostles. Nothing against women. So I didn't write the Bible. <laughs> but there are women today say, I'm an apostle. Well, who made, you know, when these people claim to be apostles, I want to ask them, who made you an apostle? Who made Paul an apostle? Jesus did. If, if somebody is called to ministry, who calls them? Church of God doesn't call anybody. 
Pastors don't call people to ministry. Parents don't call people to ministry. Heritage doesn't call. We're called by God. If you're not called by God, it's just a job. You're a hireling. Paul says, such are false apostles. These men who would come and claim to be apostles and claim to have authority, they did not get their authority from Christ. True authority, whether it be an apostle or a pastor or a preacher or a teacher, authority comes from Christ. He's the head of the church. He's in charge. He's the one, if anybody stands up here and preaches, and we preach with authority, it's because Christ has given us the authority to preach His Word. It's not our own authority. We don't get authority from Cleveland, Tennessee. They'll give you a piece of credential, a piece of paper that you don't have to pay to park at the hospital. You know. And that's all right. They recognize calling. They, they offer positions in the body of Christ. That, that's all right. But true, apostle, true ministry is called by Christ. There were false apostles in those days, and there are false, false apostles today. The apostolic reformation, how many people have heard that term? I'm asking these people, who made these people apostles? Where'd you get, did you meet Jesus on the Damascus Road? Well, I went, if somebody claims to be an apostle, the first thing I want to ask them is, who do you answer to? <laughs> okay. False apostles, deceitful workers. Well, if you read through Jude's letter, he describes these people. They're workers. They do a lot of work. But they work in deceit. They have an agenda. They have a purpose. And it's not of God. They transform themselves into the apostles of Christ. They're really apostles of Satan. Satan. But they know how to make themselves look and sound similar to a real apostle. Listen to what he says. It's no marvel. For Satan himself is what? Transformed into an angel of light. Lucifer, the light bearer. He started out as an angel of light. He was created as a light bearer. He was created as the worship leader of all the angels. Until pride was revealed in him. I was thinking in the Word, there are Satan, there, there are three personifications of Satan. The first of course, is in Genesis chapter 3 when he's the serpent. To get a, a picture of that, turn with me over to Colossians. Colossians chapter 2. I apologize, I did not put that in the, in the Zion works there. Colossians chapter 2. And... Uh, We'll just, we'll just, uh, let's, let's start with verse 1 and read down. And uh, you can put the whole chapter in and we'll start at 1 and end up where we end up, okay. Uh, Colossians chapter 2. Listen to what Paul writes. For I would that you knew what great conflict I have for you and for them at Laodicea, and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh, that their hearts might be comforted, being knit together in love, and unto all riches of the full assurance of understanding to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of the Father and of the Christ, in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Now, in Paul's day and in our day, there was a, what they would call the mystery religions. They exist today. Mystery religions are those religions that try to tell you that if you really want to make it into heaven or whatever their idea of heaven is, you have to have secret esoteric knowledge imparted unto you through 
ascended masters, the people who have gone that way before. Much of what passes for Christianity today is, well, you know, I have this teaching, and if you hear it, well, you'll be. It goes beyond the simplicity that is Christ. There's no secret teaching. There's no hidden meaning. He says, and this I say, in verse 4, lest any man should beguile you with enticing words. This is, this is the serpent, the personification of the serpent. For though I be absent in the flesh, yet am I with you in the spirit, joying and beholding your order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. As you have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, as you have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. Now here in verse 8. Beware. This is, this is the serpent. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit. What did serpent say to Eve? He questioned. He philosophically questioned the word of God. Did God really say? Philosophy. And vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. Satan the serpent, the most subtle of all beasts, attacked the the philosophical basis of faith in God. You know, as long as Adam and Eve believed God and didn't eat of that tree, they were doing good. But as soon as they were, as soon as Satan appealed to their thinking, to their mind, and philosophically attacked God's word, and they believed it, how much, how many of the great philosophers of the world, Plato, Socrates, Aristotle, and going down through the centuries to the last hundred years, How many of them truly acknowledged a God in heaven who cares about the lives of his people? Philosophy will mitigate against Christ. That's the serpent. Another manifestation or personification of Satan in 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 8, we don't have to tur- turn there. It says, For Satan roams about as a what? A roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Another thing that, that the serpent uses is intimidation. If he can't deal with us philosophically, he'll try to intimidate us. And the Bible and really history is full of examples of how Satan has tried to intimidate, tried to stamp out the gospel. All through the dark ages, really, ever since, ever since the crucifixion, there has been the gospel going forth and Satan's attempt to stamp it out, to persecute it out of existence, to threaten, uh, uh, threaten it out of existence. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar threatened the Hebrew boys. Uh, and on and on throughout the scriptures, there's, you know, Jezebel threatened Elijah. I mean, there's so many examples of the roaring lion. The threat of official persecution that has gone on throughout the ages. The third manifestation that we just read about in 2 Corinthians is the angel of light. If he can't philosophically deceive us, if he can't intimidate us, if he can't beat us, he will join us. And he'll come with a suit and a tie and praise the Lord. He'll come with the gospel music, worship music. And he'll make you think that he's an apostle. The other night, Rose and I were flicking through the channels. And we went on the one that has a telethon. And there was a guy there I'd never seen. A new guy. I said, let's see what this guy has to say. And I started listening to him. And sure enough, 
They'll pull out the old widow. <laughs> you know, they'll pull out the widow's mite and the lady from Zarephath. And, the... and I looked this guy up on the internet. And he calls himself a success coach. Jesus is Lord. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Reading God's word. An angel of light. Stars on all the Christian TV shows. Got a big church. You know, travels everywhere. Gets a big honorarium. Big honorarium. People eat it up. How much of what we've heard in the last 5, 10, 15 years, people that have been accepted as pastor, reverend, apostle, and they come and they'll, and, they'll, and they'll start reading God's word and they'll tell the truth, but then they'll get to one place and they'll just put one little, just maybe one little clause in. And if you're not, if you don't really catch it, you just go right through. You say, yeah, sounds good. Hey, this guy's pretty good. Until, you know, the rubber meets the road. Paul says, false apostles, deceitful workers, Coming across as being on God's side. Peter said it like this in 2 Peter chapter 2, and we're going to close with this. Second Peter chapter 2, but there were false prophets among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you. It's no mystery. It's no secret. He warned us. Why are we so gullible? He says, they'll privately shall bring in damnable heresies. They're not going to wear a sign on their a name tag that says heretic. False teacher. They'll wear a name tag that says prophet. You know, I'm a prophet. Apostle. They'll privately bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them and bring upon themselves swift destruction. Do these people realize? When, li listen to what they say. Listen carefully to every word. So it can only be like one or two little words. A sentence, a phrase that can turn it around. And many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. And through covetousness shall they with feigned words make merchandise. When they look at their congregation, they see dollar signs in the pew. Dollar signs. Take the offering. I believe in offering, tithes, it's important. They'll make merchandise of you. Amos, remember when we were talking about Amos, the Old Testament prophet, he said they would sell the people for a pair of shoes. Nowadays they'll sell them for a Rolex watch and a, and a corporate jet. And he goes on and he talks about their judgment. And he talks about, you know, they're going to get theirs. But listen, we need to be astute and aware. We need to have our eyes open and our ears open according to the Holy Spirit. To listen carefully. When somebody stands up here whether it be me or anybody, listen carefully. Now, I'm not saying, you know, we're all human. We can all make a mistake here or there. 
But I want to tell you something. You let your life, you let your reputation be your, be your resume. You, you let the way you carry yourself. And this is if you, if you, if you, if you, if you want to get into ministry, if you're just living the Christian life. That's why the Bible says to be above reproach. Let your life speak for itself. So when you speak the word, that'll be the foundation. That's what Paul was saying back there in Corinthians. He's saying, yeah, I could tell you about, you know, I was a Jew, I was a Hebrew, I was Benjamite, I was all this and that. I, I was an apostle. He, he, goes, on, he, he goes on back there. Just, just turn back there for a minute in 2 Corinthians. He said, uh, in, ch- in chapter 11, look, Paul, Paul was giving his resume, starting at verse 21. Well, look at verse uh, 18. Seeing that many glory after the flesh, I will glory also. Paul says, well, they brag about their accomplishments. I'll brag about mine. Okay. For you suffer fools gladly, seeing as you yourselves are wise. For you suffer if a man bring you into bondage, if a man devour you, if a man take of you, if a man exalt himself, if a man smite you on the face. Oh, Paul, he's laying it down. He says, I speak as concerning reproach as though we had been weak. Howbeit, whereinsoever any is bold, I speak foolishly. I am also, he's saying, you want to you know my credentials? Are they Hebrews? Me too. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they the seed of Abraham? I got the, I got the pedigree to prove it. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more. See if you want to apply for this job. In labor's more abundant, in stripes above measure. Stripes, that's not stripes like you get in the army as a sergeant. <laughs> that's a different kind of stripes. In stripes above measure, in prisons more frequent, in deaths often. Of the Jews, five times received, not 40 stripes, save one. They beat me up five times. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day I have been in the deep, in journeyings often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils by my own countrymen. Everybody hated me. In perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and painfulness. Hey, I'm an apostle. Apostles today ain't going to apply for this job. Apostles today will stay in the penthouse with the gold faucets, you know. Weariness, painfulness, watchings often, and hunger and thirst, and fastings often, and cold and nakedness. Beside those things that are without, that which comes upon me daily, the care of, of all the churches, beside all that stuff has happened to me, I've got to worry about all you too. All these churches I plant all over Europe and Asia. He says, Who is weak and I am not weak, and who is offended and I burn not? If I must needs glory, I will glory of the things which concern my infirmities. Paul saying, listen, these guys you got coming to you, find out, see, see what they've been through for the sake of the gospel. Give them, give them, give them the apostle test. See, when, when we listen to people speak, I thank God for like the local church, because you know the people in this, we all know each other. We all know each other, we all know each other's faults. Like in a family, you know, when you're in a family, you find out each other's fault. When you get married, you find that out real quick. <laughs> and love covers a multitude, I thank God, love covers a multitude of sins, you know. But we get to know each other. These people that claim to be apostles and preachers and prophets, and listen to them very carefully and check out their credentials. Not, not the piece of paper they get from some organization. A lot of them give themselves. You know, you could start your own church and make yourself an apostle. We could start the first church of Crystal here, and Crystal couldn't give out licenses. Just incorporate and <laughs> put a sign. That's what they do. You know. I'm, 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 getting, I'm rambling. I'm getting off the track. Just read a little bit more. We're going to close. 
The God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, in verse 31, which is blessed forevermore, knows that I lie not. In Damascus, the governor under Aretas, the, the king, kept the city of Damascus with a garrison desirous to apprehend me. Man, he said, they were looking for me. People were hunting me down. They wanted to kill me. So these are my credentials. I traveled all over Europe and Asia planting churches, not because it paid good, but because God told me to. And every one of us, whether you're a pastor or just somebody, a Christian that loves the Lord, what you do for the Lord, you don't do because you're getting paid for it. You know, if I ever get to the point where I do this job because of the money, I'll go get a job. I'll go, I'll go to Walmart and go greet people, you know. <laughs> nothing, wrong with, nothing wrong with paying ministry. Don't misunderstand me. But he did all this stuff not for the money, not for the recognition, not for the glory, but he did it because Jesus told him to. And you know what? There were probably times that Paul didn't feel like doing it. There were probably times that Paul did not feel like getting beat up. But he did it because Jesus told him to. I remember one time I was watching the guy in New York with the, with the, uh, with the school buses, Bill Wilson. You, ever, you, you know who I'm talking about, Bill Wilson? He had long hair for a while. He had a long-haired guy. He had, he had a great ministry in, in the slums of, of New York City. And somebody asked him, so you see if I can remember the question. Somebody asked him, you know, uh, oh, it was something along the lines of, oh, you must be really blessed. He says, he said, no. He says, I do this because God told me to do it. I got all these buses. I got all these kids. I got this ministry. I got to worry about money. I got to worry about paying for all this. And somebody said, oh, you must really be blessed. You must really, you must really feel. And he said, no, I do it because God told me to do it. See, when we're, when we're listening to what people are teaching, a little off the track, I guess, a little off base, but when we're listening, listen, Satan wants to, wants to make you think that he's the greatest preacher that ever lived. So I guess tonight I'll leave you with this. You know, I'll be back in three weeks on a Wednesday night. We'll go with Zachariah. Be careful what you listen to out there. Somebody tells you about a new preacher that, man, just you go listen to, find out where he comes from. Find out what his background is. Find out about his lifestyle. Yeah, I, I can talk about the folks that I know in this church, you know, you, you can look it up. Not just me, but other people that minister in this church. You can, nobody's perfect. If you look close enough, you're going to find something wrong. It's like this church, and I know other pastors in this town. I know how they live. I know them. They're men of God. Not perfect. The pastors and the preachers that I respect as having wisdom and experience and knowledge, they're people who have lived the life and are living the life. So my prayer is for us, for all of us, whether we're called to ministry or just just called to be good Christian neighbors. There are neighbors who look at us and say, I'm going to listen to what they say.